Any questions for the speakers, please raise your hand. I will choose on you, and then any of the speakers can answer, inshallah. Um, I just wanted to ask about uh, our conversation in, in, in the workplace. There was a session this morning about the workplace I couldn't make, it, unfortunately, I'm kicking myself. But um, the, the idea of reaching out and um, uh, you know, being, being um, truthful, but at the same time being kind to other people, especially in the context of us being in the workforce as young professionals and kind of trying to both conform to the norms of work in kind of in some way or another to be cheerful and to be uh, helpful, but at the same time having this shadow of uh, Gaza and Palestine um, behind us and not trying to be obnoxious about it, talking to other people, but also trying to kind of have conversations with them about it and about our role in kind of averting those effects as much as possible. What would your advice be for us um, in terms of uh, uh, um, in terms of making sure that people kind of get us, but at the same time we're, we're kind of still maintaining that mentality? Jazakallah khairan. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalam ala rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, two things I want to share, inshallah. First and foremost, Jazakallah khairan for sharing that initiative. One of the things that I think we sometimes get wrong is we think the only way to call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by like literally going out in the streets and saying, Qul ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. May Allah reward us. Ameen. Um, but that's not the only way. Things like Muslims, part of our Muslim identity is our architecture is our clothing, is our mannerisms, is our food, all of this is a part of it and we need places in which that progresses so I really appreciate you sharing the idea of like architecture there should be a conversation about how do the Islamic ethics of architecture come into the conversations around how we plan our cities where we value things like privacy, where we value things like not blocking our neighbors rights Right? That's a part of it. Um, in, uh, any, anytime I get a chance on campus, I oftentimes like having this conversation with students of every field you go into, there is an Islamic ethos and ethics of it that you bring to the forefront because Islam wasn't there to change a society in terms of like negate what it has. It's to bring the best principles of that society. The majority of what we now think of Muslim was actually things that we appropriated from another culture, but we made it better. So if you see, like, when I ask my uh, th uh, four-year-old son to draw a masjid, he draws a dome. Was a dome Muslim? No. You know when we started adopting the dome? When the Muslims saw the Hagia Sophia, which was actually as the citadel in Constantinople. When the Muslims saw it, they're like, wow, that looks amazing. And we took it. And we said, actually, it serves our purpose even better. It's a big prayer hall without pillars in it. But now that has become a Muslim symbol, right? There's so many of these. Muslims saw a bunch of taverns everywhere where people were getting drunk. We said, you know, there's a better use for that. We made coffee houses, <laughs> right? Because why? Inshallah, it's a place that people can gather and socialize. Inshallah, not consuming something haram, but consuming, well, not getting into coffee and what it does. But still, consuming something that leads to some good conversations taking place. So it's this approach of Jazakallah for, for that component that actually segues into the next answer as well. Which is, when it comes to, of course, all of us have this position of what we care about our brothers and sisters in Gaza, the atrocities that are taking place. And in the workplace, how do you bring that up? Because certain times the retaliation might be severe. This is where I say we appreciate that many different people have many different tasks to play. What I mean by that is I get this all the time where a student goes, I want to post and I want to show up to every rally, but I'm actually interviewing for law school right now. And it's at a firm in which if I was seen or anything happened, I don't know what's going to take place. So this is where I first say we need to have um, appreciation for the roles that different people have to play. Someone might not be able to do the same style of activism that you can, but then I would tell that student, when, if you're going to sacrifice this part of you, when it comes to the fundraisers and the relief, you better bankroll this. Why? Because you can't let your activism be less. If you can't be on the front line here, you need to be on a front line somewhere else, if that's what you're sacrificing. Though each of us have to, has to understand what is our role to be played in, in a given um, uh, situation that we find ourselves in. But with that said, some of the, the I'll, I'll, I'll uh, inshallah, add on to uh, um, Namtai's points that he just made a little bit ago, where there are opportunities to bring this up. One question I would ask is the human level is something almost no one can deny. Even the most staunch Zionists that I have to face sometimes on campus, when they ask like, how are you doing or something? I'll be like, I just had a conversation with my Palestinian mother. 
And I do have a Palestinian mother. It was my neighbor growing up. I'm not going to say her name because I don't know if she'd appreciate this. But she, I consider her my Palestinian mother. And I was like, she just lost 23 members last night of her family. And we were talking on the phone for two hours, but she didn't lose hope. It doesn't matter what place you're in. That's a human mourning that we're going through. And sometimes we have to ask, if I'm not affected in that way, what am I not doing properly? Because what? My Palestinian brothers and sisters deserve support in this moment. If I'm not reaching out, that's a human portion that I can share if I can't necessarily share a moment of what, like, actual activism. There's creative ways of being, um, of, of, of showing compassion. And sometimes you have to look for what is that way going to be. So in the workplace, it could be something like that. A personal story, if it's not going to be, you being the one who pushes to say, say that, no, our company needs to be more moral. Our messaging in our company needs to be better. Those are roles for certain people, but sometimes we can't be at those forefronts. And we have thick skin and, and, and appreciate the others. But if you do find yourself in a position where you can do that, we also need people who can change that um, cultural uh, use their cultural capital in order to change the actual messaging. So that's, of course, necessary as well. So I'm hoping that helps a bit. Yeah. Any other questions? Front row. Assalamu alaikum. So in the first lecture, you had mentioned that the Mongols, one of the things that they admired about the Muslims was that, um, or a section of the Muslims was that they um, destroy like themselves to find God. But I wanted to know what you mean by the word destroy and connecting to the second lecture um, and uh, controlling or commanding nafs. Like what would your um, advice be on controlling that? And does that mean like we have to destroy our nafs or is there a positive connotation to the word nafs that we could use to, like guide ourselves to the path of Allah? That's a great question. So in my lecture, I mentioned that the Yazan, the Mongol, Mongol ruler, he found the strange practice of what's known as fana that's found within a very small section of the Muslim community, which is self-destruction in order to just appreciate and understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reason I brought that up is most Muslims will find that to be extremely problematic. Meaning that most ideas of how we practice is you don't completely let go of yourself in order to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's not it. That's not the mainstream understanding of how our spiritual practices work. Us, it's supposed to be actually the more you know yourself, the more you'll understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the more mainstream viewpoint. So that was the practice of fana. But what is beautiful about that is that's what led the majority of them into mainstream Islam. So sometimes a niche practice of a select group of people is what it takes for a group of people to find the bulk of actual Islamic practice. Does that make sense? Um, so I'll answer that, that portion of it. That's not to say... Yeah, yeah, it's more of a self-correction because the Mongols also found themselves as what? I mean complete, just consume, 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 consume. That was actually part of their culture. So what they needed was the complete opposite. But there was something beautiful that our tradition was vast enough to give them what they need. And once that need was fulfilled, actually allowed them to enter into Islam more holistically. Does that make sense? So I'll answer that portion and I'll leave it to Azim Pai to answer that. Sakulikher for the question. So I think, number one, the model for us is always Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And if you look at his life, of course, he introduced us to Salah, right? Salah is something that is a built-in self-correcting mechanism if we use it correctly. So that's something that helps us regulate our day. So as we're going through our day, it can help us put our, our nafs in check because you have to stop what you're doing. You have to make wudu and part of wudu and salah is intention. So we have to refresh our intention, you know, make sure we're clean and then pray and we're reconnecting with, with Allah. That's number one. Number two is, is dhikr. So Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was constantly making zikr throughout the day. So if somebody's making zikr, can you make zikr and do something evil at the same time? It's kind of hard. So today what we do is we have this continuous scroll, right? You go on social media and you just keep scrolling. If you were making zikr, you probably would do less scrolling. <laughs> Because you don't know what you're going to see. So like, that's how we have to now, with all the tools that we have and the way that they're pulling us in a certain direction, this is what I meant by directionality. Now we have to change our directionality and you know, we all have to do it because this is something that's pervasive 
uh, you know, for all of us. But we have the tools in the example of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just to um, add the Sufi practice that it, it um, I think the self-destruction may seem as, um, yeah, extreme. <laughs> um, so, but I'll give you an example and it will help you understand. We fast in the month of Ramadan for 29 or 30 days. Someone who's not a Muslim has not done fasting. They, what do they think? It's torture, right? Why are you keeping yourself hungry? All day long you're not going to have a sip of water. So that is one way of correcting our nafs. And that was the, some of the practice. Waking up in the middle of the night for tahajjud. What? I want to sleep for eight hours. But no, you wake up because you want to have a special relationship with Allah. That's your self-correction. Any more questions? You talked about activism and how different people have different roles and how not everyone's going to be on the front lines in the same way. So there's a lot of guilt sometimes when you're unable to show up to encampments or, act, or be an activist in the same capacity that you see other people doing. And it could lead a person to feel like, all right. This one? Is this better? All right, so sometimes we can feel a lot of guilt because we're not, you know, doing activism in the same capacity that people say in the encampments do. So my my thing that I'm wondering is, does everyone? I want to. Say, I don't want to word it as does everyone have to be there? Because what? Because you said different people have different capacities and different roles. How do you navigate? which roles are for you. Does that make sense? Like, how do you approach that? So, not everyone has a, the same role to play in any given situation, and I could very much appreciate you saying that there's sometimes guilt, that I can't be necessarily on the front lines. And with specific example that was given is the in encampments. Alhamdulillah, I've had the opportunity of visiting quite a few of them and participating in these encampments the last couple of weeks. May Allah to reward all those who made efforts. I mean, say I mean, guys. Don't be stingy with your duas. Okay. Um, but the idea comes in of what role do I have, what do I know, how, which roles do I know how, how to play. And one of the things that I'll say is we're now doing a, st a strategic analysis of which encampments were successful and which ones led to less success. They were all successful, mashallah. But which led to maybe some policy changes not happening. And one of the things that we're seeing is when there was both internal pressure and external pressure, that's when you saw certain universities like Brown, like Rutgers, yay Rutgers, okay. Um, like Brown, like Rutgers and other uh, uh, spaces, um, UC Riverside, mashallah most of all, um, that you saw their, the administration actually meeting with our students and meeting with those in the encampments and actually negotiating with them, this is what we can do and this is what we cannot do. And those people who were in the internal negotiations, they had no public presence and oftentimes the only reason they were able to have the internal negotiation is because they weren't there in the external encampments. Does that make sense? And this really comes down to what is the unique position that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put you in and what is the unique skill set and qualities that you've put that that you're able to bring to the table I remember actually I want to say November 2nd or November 3rd I received a phone call from a Muslim entrepreneur who said we are already at that point on our campus had um, seven or eight uh, uh, protests uh, pro-Palestinian protests and we were with our students every week and he called me and he said if, if you know of any students who's lost a job opportunity in this sector and there was a certain finance sector please send them my way. Our young students who are activists should not be penalized for having a moral stand. And I appreciate it so much, I immediately started sharing it with our local massages saying, we need to take care of our young people. That's that person's role because of the capacity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them. There are many roles of power to be had here, not just the one that's the most visible from time to time. And it really comes down to what seat at the table do you have? And I'll share one last story about this. I remember yeah, I, 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 can, I can repeat this. I've seen, I, I've seen my, uh, the person who went through to share this in public. Um, I know I could never work in the CIA. Why? Because yeah, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night, right? But 
there was a young uh, Muslim who was working as an auditor in the CIA. And I know most of us would be like, that's such a moral quandary. Why would you do that? But I remember the story being shared in which the CIA was having a, uh, a conversation of how to audit Muslim organizations. And they were looking for Islamic studies experts of who would train these auditors of how to deal with Muslim organizations, right? And they were thinking about names like Robert Spencer as an Islamic studies ex expert. I don't know if any of you know who Robert Spencer is. He's like he, crazy Islamophobe number one. Like it's, it's a terrible person who could do this, but people sometimes say he has a, uh, a background in Islamic studies somehow. That's a whole other problem of who has a background in Islamic studies and who doesn't. But this person, this young Muslim who was in the CIA said, actually, um, I can give you a list of five names of people who are, who the Muslim community would respect and have a much better expertise on this, put those five names in. And actually one of them was chosen as the person who was training the IRS auditors of that region. I want you to think about that is, that's a huge win when it comes down to it. Having someone who is dealing with the finances of the Muslim community in the country, now it's being consulted by a Muslim rather than by someone else because that person was what? On, it had a seat at the table. Though, I highly doubt that, that that Muslim is going to get a stage on a stage like this. Because why? Well, they know what their role is, they know what their skill set is, what position Allah SWT has put them in. It comes down to your unique personality, it comes down to your ability to kind of like where your skill set lies. And what I'll say about this as well is, this is where I think mentorship becomes really important. If you want to figure out what that is, I think it's a good um, uh, situation that we as Muslim community should like mentor each other. Like, this is what I'm in, this is the situation I find myself in. What is the Islamic work I can do in my lane that, that I currently find myself? Does that make sense? So there's going to be certain Muslims who, what do they do? Their whole task is going to be, I'm going to use the architecture example, example again because I think that's just beautiful, that we're going to use architecture. That what? This is something that we should talk about the beauty of Islam in architecture. Someone else who says, no, I'm actually on the media front. Someone else who says, no, I'm going to be someone who uses my Islamic values to actually handle how divorces in our community are done with more Islamic ethos. Like, whatever you actually have, that's what you use um, to, to, to do well in. Does anybody, do you want to add anything? I see. What? The follow-up question was, would you say it's more destructive to do something that's against your skill set or capacity? We all, there are certain times in which all of, we need all hands on deck. So that does happen. That's why even in our deen, for example, it's, everyone has to show up to Jum'ah. Ah. There's no excuse. You have to come to Jum'ah. Ah. But does everyone have to show up for Qiyam at the same time? No. There's some people who need Qiyam more, some people who need Qiyam less. There's going to be different times to do different things. Same thing here, where certain times we need everyone. But other times, I would agree with you that your passion and your skill set, someone who is not a great um, speaker should not be the one who's given the mic at a rally. Why? Because it's, it might actually look bad. They might say something that is going to be destructive to the whole cause in general because they're just not a very good speaker. And on the other hand, someone who's not very good at finances should not be the treasurer of some of our Muslim organizations. Because why? If you're not good at finances, I don't want you to be the one who has to document the books because that's maybe not your role there. Someone who's good at counseling, they should utilize being a good counselor versus someone who has a terrible idea of having patience. Now they become the mentor or counselor of everyone. Do you, do you see my point? You play with the talents that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you knowing that you do have a role in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but I need to find what that specific one is, and that's oftentimes where mentorship and your companions come, come to play, and your community should be able to foster that for you. Inshallah, I'm just going to add with, um, you know, personal story. So when October 7 happened, then there were many of the young Muslims alumni who were concerned because we knew what was going to come next. We knew there was going to be at least at minimum an incursion and it was going to be bad. So we started organizing and we said, okay, we know we're going to have to have rallies, right? But in addition to rallies, what else can we do? We said, okay, we're going to go to DC. We're going to have rallies at, you know, in front of, uh, you know, um, key legislators, uh, offices, etc. Fine. Then we said, what else can we do? So, so we said, okay, we can rent trucks, right? And run ads on them. So in the beginning, the message was, the short-term message was, ceasefire now, right? 
and everyone could agree to that. Doesn't even take much of a designer to even make that, right? Just put in really big words, ceasefire now. Then we said, okay, that's good for short term. What else can we do? So then some people said, you know, we can do car rallies. We can get uh, like basically a procession of cars with flags and messages and we can drive through neighborhoods to raise awareness. Okay, great. What else can we do? Is there anything we can do long term? So a group of us, we got together and we just sat there and brainstormed. And in the room, you had one person that was a graphic designer, another that understood how to do online advertisements, and the third was just an IT person who knew how to put it together. And we came up with this concept called visitgaza.com. And what it is is it's a fake travel website. It looks like a travel website, but as you dig into it, you start to learn about the facts about the occupation and how it's affecting the people that live there. And we also paint the picture. Everyone can pull out your phone and go, go to the website right now, visitgaza.com. And we, we, what we did is with the graphic designer, we came up with these advertisements that were very catchy like one that had a picture of a, a young child and it said, take a trip without the kids, visit Gaza. So when people see these ads, they would have this visceral kind of reaction, like what is this? Like this can't be real. And we knew from the polls that young people on the left, even before October, they were at 51% pro-Palestine amongst millennials. So we knew where things were trending. So we said, okay, we're gonna do targeted advertising aimed at people under the age of 39. We're gonna run the same ad and we're going to direct it at different target audiences. Young women on the left, young women on the right, young men on the left, young men on the right. And we're gonna see how do these ads fare. So we took our skills and knowledge of how to manage data analytics and we put together a campaign that would have a purpose and a meaning because we wanted to see, could we take the overall polling and compare that to our metrics and see, can we have an impact that's going against the trend line? Or can we accelerate that trend where young people were, uh, you know, coming more towards the pro-Palestinian side? And we always, say, we always say, only if Americans knew. Only if Americans knew the history. Only if they knew that this didn't start in October. Only if they knew about the Nakba. So this became a creative way to teach about that. So every single one of the people on the call could have just said, okay, we're just gonna go to DC for a rally and that will be the end of it, right? But others said, no, let's think out of the box. Like what else can we do? And that's something every single person here can ask themselves. What are my skill sets? What can I do, right? What networks do I have? What kind of influence do I have? And what should my messaging be? What should my approach be that will resonate with, with others where I can make a change? Even if it's me just talking one-on-one -on -one with somebody uh, at work, or if it's convincing your workplace to say, hey, you gave money for humanitarian aid after October 7 to Israel. Look, there's a much bigger crisis now in Gaza. Let's, let's be balanced and let's at least donate some money there as well. Let's support uh, the, the UN, you know, UNICEF, or uh, there's so many arms that that are involved that you could say, okay, these are mainstream, you know, nonprofit humanitarian organizations. Let's donate to them, right? The, uh, I think it was the uh, Palestinian Children's Fund that they're especially a Christian organization, and their headquarters was was hit. So, Zakalakhir.